Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139. Dennis Walton of Milwaukee is an independent candidate in the 16th Assembly District. The election is uh, November 3. Dennis, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm curious. My first question for independent candidates is why, why they've chosen to run uh, not as a Republican or a Democrat. Could you give me your quick answer to that? Oh, not a problem. Yeah, I, I chose to run as an independent because I think that, you know, when you look at both sides of the aisle, um, Republican and Democrat, people are, uh, the, the philosophies are the part of the parties are, I feel, out of tune and out of touch with the spirit and the soul and with the real needs of what people are. And I think that both parties are too focused on partisan politics and putting the, the politics over the people. And as an independent candidate, um, I feel like uh, that there's an opportunity to carry the voice of the people and not be uh, beholding to any party politics or partisan politics, but really just the mission and the needs of what people are in our community. So as an independent voice, I think it gives uh, it gives a, a, a better leverage to uh, represent the voice of the people without having the strings attached. Just to follow up on that and clarify then, what do you think is your top issue in your campaign? The top issue, I think the top issue in the campaign, it varies because the, the nature of my district is so different. Uh, the personality of the district is, is very different, you know, but I think that uh, people need a sense of hope on all sides. People think people need um, someone who's going to fight for them and they need someone who understands the nature of the differences that exist within a district like the 16th Assembly. So where you have the eastern side of the district, that's a very wealthy aspect of the district, and you have the western side of the district that's, that's most impoverished, um, you have to have a candidate that is in line with the values of all of the personality traits of the district and make sure that they speak appropriately to the needs and not just one-sided. Well, um, how hard has the district, the 16th, been hit by the pandemic and um what do you think are the next step the state should take to help the residents of your district recover from the pandemic? Well, one of the things that we need to look at is that the leadership through the pandemic, in my, in my opinion, has been very, very confusing. And people don't feel as though um, those who are in leadership capacities are providing proper information to help give them direction so that they can have trust in our, our infrastructure, in our system, and in our government so that they can feel comfortable that uh, things are going to get better. So I think all across the board, there's a sense of, of, of hopelessness um, to some extent when it comes to believing in, in the government because people feel things have been just so mishandled. So I think the, mo the, the most important priority right now with all of the bickering that goes back and forth between both parties, we have to have a candidate that res can restore trust in the people and that people can believe that a candidate is going to really fight for their issues and not be aligned to uh, party interest, but the, the, the interest of the people. If the pandemic results in less state tax collections in this budget year, which ends June 30, would you, uh, let's say we don't collect a, a billion dollars in taxes, would you want to uh, raise taxes or would you want to uh, uh, cut spending? I want to cut spending. You know, I think, I think there's so much wasteful spending that takes place in this state. And I think that if we did a proper audit and assessment of all of the departments that spend money and do a proper assessment of those dollars going out and what's the return on those investments, we can find, we can find areas that we can cut spending and reappropriate um, dollars to offset you know, to offset that spending and not continue to raise taxes. People are burdened. And when you look at COVID-19 and what it has done, it has decimated our economy. And again, it's decimated a lot of the hopes uh, of people. So we, I, I think as candidates and as, as, as legislators and policymakers, we need to be doing things that give people hope that inspire people and not continue to burden people. And I think that continuing to tax people in a time where um, the economy is failing, 
Uh, people are suffering from high levels of unemployment. You have all of these different circumstances that we're dealing with. Raising taxes creates more of a burden, and we need to be doing everything we can to, um, to, to lift the burdens off of people and give them a sense of hope um, that their government is working on their behalf. Follow up on the pandemic, the issue of face masks is pretty emotional. Um, there's some Republicans, lawmakers, who want to come back to the Capitol and uh, do away with the governor's statewide mask edict. Do you have a position on the, 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 the face masks uh, edict? Well, again, I think that with all of the misinformation that's been given with about the pandemic and so many different um, stories that have gone back and forth as far as what is important and what's not important, people are confused. But I think that, you know, when we first started this pandemic, to take every necessary precaution to save people's life was the most appropriate thing to do. And if masks was, could, could accomplish that, then I think that that's what we needed to do. But not the pandemic was something that we've never experienced before. So now that we have, now that we're several months into this pandemic, I think that we should be able to have enough scientific research and enough data to tell us is it is it is is it appropriate for us to continue a mandatory uh, mask, or you know, is this thing improving to the point where we can alleviate some of these uh, mandated things? So I think there's a, there needs to be a proper assessment of where we are now because there were so many things that we did not know in the beginning of this pandemic. And again, if we look at the data and we look at the science and we look at the lives and we look at the recoveries, if we're if, if we can do an assessment to say, as a as a collective, okay, we don't we no longer need masks, then I think that that's something we should be able to um, agree to without it being a political a political issue. But if we look at this data and we see that the numbers are still increasing and that people's health are is continuing to fail, then we should collectively be able to say, well, this is something that has worked for us. And, and with, with this science and what this data tells us is we need to continue this. So I think there needs to be a proper assessment of what the needs are right now and then move forward. Hospitals have been on the front lines of treating COVID-19 patients. If you remember the legislature voting on the next state budget, should hospitals get an even bigger priority than they may have gotten in this current budget? Well, again, I, I don't think that money should just be spent frivolous, frivolously. I think that you should be able to look, you should be able to do the proper audit and the proper assessment of the dollars that have been allocated to these institutions. And we need to be able to see what was the result and the impact of those dollars, of those dollars and were, that, were those dollars that were invested in those institutions in fact, effective in accomplishing what the goals have been, and if they and if those things have been uh, accomplished accomplished effectively, then we need to say, okay, where where does money need to be spent at responsibly, not just putting dollars into institutions without understanding what the proper assessment and what the audit is. But if we can justify that these dollars need to be invested um, again, or more dollars need to be invested to improve the circumstances then of course, by all means, we wanna make sure that we're appropriately uh, putting those dollars in the place that, they're, that, that they need to be. But I do not think that we should continue to just dump money into institutions without doing an audit, without doing an assessment, and without making an appropriate decision on what the impact of those dollars have been. Last week, State Senator Chris Kappinga introduced a bill that said, if a business or an organization has followed the COVID protocols to protect its patients, its employees, or its customers, they should be exempt from lawsuits over COVID. Do you think we need that law? No, I, I think I think that it should be, I think that there should be, it should be judged on a case by case basis. Because if a business has, if a business is doing what's responsible um, to make sure that people are, um, that people's health is a priority within their, within their institutions or within their organizations and businesses, um, then of course we wanna make sure that they're treated fairly. But if a business has not take, taken the proper protocols and you see people getting sick, um, I think that needs to be addressed as well. So I don't believe that um, just every business should just necessarily be exempt. I think cases should be examined appropriately and all the facts should be brought to the table and decisions should be made appropriately based upon what those assessments have been. The debate over police reforms is going kind of three ways in the Capitol. The governor has a, called a special session. He's got nine bills. The speaker's forming a task force. Republican Senator Van Wangard has his, got his own bills. 
What police reforms do you think are needed, sir? Um, again, when you talk about the issue of police reform, because there is such a diverse perspective on what police forms, what, what, what police reform should be, I think that there needs to be a, I think the best thing that we could do is listen to what the wants and what the needs of the people are. Look at, um, look at not, not make decisions based off emotion, but look at, make decisions based off of what's the intelligent thing to do. Uh, do we want to just defund our police and not have ap appropriate police services in our communities? I think no one agrees with that, you know, but I do think that there are areas within um, criminal justice reform, police reform, where we can look at how we renew or how we reinstitute some of the policies that are outdated. And I think that if you're going to focus on reform, you need to look at some of those old and outdated practices and norms, and we need to say, um, what's current and what's relevant today and how do we move forward intelligently with policing that makes sense there are many different models that have been um, displayed and, and presented um, all over the community when you talk about police reform and when you talk about um, community policing all of these things i think are very relevant and all of the discussions are relevant when you talk about the, the aspect of uh, qualified immunity some of these things that that people are really that, that that are really serious things that we need to take a look at. I believe that we can look at we can look at we can make intelligent decisions on how to reform our police and make sure that it's appropriate with the alignment with the needs of the people, as well as respecting law enforcement and what their what their safety issues are and what their true needs are as well. The states around Wisconsin are legalizing marijuana. What's your position on legalizing both medical and recreational marijuana, sir? Um, I think that I think that when you start talking about legalizing a substance that has been illegal for so much time, and when you talk about uh, you know when you look at the issue of how many people have been incarcerated over the years over something like marijuana, I think the laws need to reflect need to be reflective of um, what's happening today. I think you have to be very responsible when you start talking about legislating recreational marijuana. Um, I think you need to do a proper examination of the effects of recreational mar marijuana in communities, and is it helping to improve communities? If, re if, if, if legalizing recreational marijuana in urban environments and in communities all over the nation, if you can tell me that that will improve the condition of a community, then I'm all for it. But again, we also have to look at, you know, how the influence of marijuana leads to other things for some people as well, and how it has become potentially, you know, something that may harm people if they're not responsible in the way that they go about it. So I just think that legislation around recreational marijuana needs to be closely looked at, and it needs to, and the assessment needs to be, if we legalize marijuana in our communities, does it make our community a better place? That's the number one factor that we need to determine when we talk about recreational marijuana. Now, when we talk about medicinal uh, marijuana, I think that the science has proven that medicinal marijuana has worked wonders in many of uh, circumstances for people who are dealing with different ailments. So I think the science um, is there. And I think that if, if we're going to be responsible about looking at um, alternative med medicines and cures, and we look at real science and we don't allow politics to motivate our decisions around how we do these things, then it can be something that's very positive for our communities. But I think the medicinal aspect of it, the science is there, the recreational aspect of it, I think we need to pay closer attention to how that affects our communities, how that affects our communities. Okay. And then we, don't, we wanna make sure that we're sending the proper uh, that we want to send the proper messaging to our youth because personally okay. I don't want to see young people um, high on marijuana and not being able to focus on their studies and their schools and I don't want to send the wrong message of glorifying a substance when we should be glorifying where we should be uplifting the community we, we can be providing things that are, are are very much more uplifting to our community as well Do you support the governor's proposal for a People's Maps Commission to draw the next set of congressional and legislative district lines. The Constitution says the party in power in the Capitol should draw them. Who should draw those lines? 
Well, personally, I believe that when you look at the issue of those lines, uh, for too long, it has been politically motivated. And when, whenever you have one party that has more power than the other, when they draw the lines, they draw the lines based upon what's most beneficial to them and to their party and to the demographics that they're trying to, uh, to that they're trying to target or market to or make sure that they have access to. So um, I think that that need, I think that those decisions should be bipartisan. I think that you should be able to make, I think that both parties should be able to make a healthy decision based upon what the needs of the people are. You cannot continue to draw lines because you're looking at um, the uh, the census and you're looking at who's voted and who hasn't voted, or you're looking at circumstances, uh, you know, or where, where, you know, who's the most affluent people in your community or who's not, who's, who's impoverished, who's not impoverished. All of these different things that are motivating uh, the drawing of these lines today, I think are self-centered, self-motivated, and they're not in the best interest of the community. If you're going to draw these lines, make sure that it's reflective of what the needs of the community are and that there's balance so that we're not seeing one party try to cheat one another based upon them having power in the time that they do, and now they're in the, in the position to draw the lines. Wisconsin has high property taxes. Because of that, school districts and local governments have had to live with caps and controls on their property tax levies for more than 20 years. If you're in the legislature, would you vote to continue those caps and limits on property taxes to, con uh, 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 to control property taxes? Yeah, I think, I think that, I think we have to do everything we can in this time to make sure that we're balanced in how we go about raising property taxes, okay? Now, if property taxes are being increased based upon the investment and the improvement of communities, and we can see that improvement in communities, we can see that investment in communities, constituents are satisfied with the investments and they are benefiting from it, then of, by all means, okay, that, that justifies us raising taxes. But if you're not seeing these improvements in your community, if you're not seeing um, you know, your burdens being lifted. If you're not seeing the proper investment into your neighborhoods, then we should not make, we should make sure that property taxes are not rising at a rate that's faster than the improvement of a community. And, 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 and in, in a lot of circumstances, that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing taxes being raised in communities, but we're not seeing improvement in communities. We're seeing taxes being raised in communities, but we're not seeing investment in communities. And I think that people need to see that balance. If their dollars are going to be spent, their, their dollars need to have the greatest impact. We forget that these tax dollars belong to constituents. They belong to everyday citizens. They belong to people who work every day and pay taxes. And I think the government, um, I think the government sometimes forgets that. And again, so if we're going to raise taxes and we're going to do these things, it, it has to be balanced with uh, investment that people can feel, that they can see, and that they can benefit from, not just their taxes increase it and there's no result. Also, we have to look at those who are most vulnerable in our community when we look at our elders. Right now, we have an aging uh, population in our community of people who are homeowners who are becoming homeless, and they're becoming homeless because taxes are being raised, property taxes are being increased, are being increased fines are being levied against them. Um, I think that we should be able to preserve and protect those most vulnerable people in our communities, which are our elders, and we should be able to create some type of incentive, moratorium, or tax freezes um, to be able to prevent them from losing their properties to, to foreclosure or losing their properties to um, taxes being increased because now their, uh, their monthly tax bill has went up or their yearly tax bill has went up and it's outside of their income. We need to take into consideration those who have paid in and we need to create incentives to make sure that they are safe. And I think that we can accomplish that if we're really focused on it. Do local governments need alternative sources of revenue? State Representative Evan Goyke has a bill that would let Milwaukee County, after a referendum, add an additional half cent sales tax. Do, do you support that bill? Do local governments need more sources of revenue? Um, I think local governments do. We, we're, we're always, as, as, as we move forward into the future, uh, we're, we have to look at how we grow our economy. We have, to look, we have to look at how we grow our revenue and how we grow 
income to take care of the growing needs that are going on in our community. We cannot sit back and just be stagnant and not be creative about how we look at investment that grows income so that we can supply the proper needs for our community. Um, so I think that when you look at an increase in revenue, uh, or, or, or when you look at that increase, we have to be creative about going about that. And there are ways that we should be able to accomplish that without burden, continuing to bur putting a burden on people. But I do think that it's necessary that we um, increase our spending as it, as it pertains to the issues that we're dealing with and looking at how our future is coming about. Last year, the governor recommended raising the gas tax. It's 30.9 cents a gallon Could you, uh, to stabilize funding for highways and bridges. Could you vote to raise the uh, gas tax? Um, I think that first I would like to know how, we, how he came to that number. You know, how did we come to that number of 30.9? You know, and then what? How does that? How does that thirty point nine number accomplish the goals that we need to have accomplished in our community when we look at the investment that needs to be um, leveraged in our community? And if we can justify that that amount of spending um, for improvements, and we can accomplish our goals through that, I would I would vote for it. But again, I would think that we would be able to have an appropriate conversation to understand how we came to that number. And, and specifically how that number is going to accomplish us being able to um, see success when we invest these dollars or when we have these increases. So if we can see the success through that investment or that increase, I would approve of it. But again, I would think there needs to be a balancing conversation to understand exactly how we got to that number and, and specifically what is it going to accomplish. Okay, almost out of time, only two more questions. Should local uh, local school boards, local governments if they if they plan a major public works project, should they have to give a preference to uh, to businesses who who are in Wisconsin? Yes, yes. Okay. I think okay. Then the final question: uh, You want to highlight differences between the Republican and Democrats, and why you're more qualified on for voters on November three? Well, you know, for me, it's very simple. Um, I've worked. I've worked in the capacity of serving people most of my adult life. Um, I'm very much connected to the issues that affect our community. I, 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 I listen and pay attention very closely uh, to the needs of people. I'm hands-on every day working in our community to help people change their lives. And um, I'm amongst the people. I'm amongst the people and I'm going through the very same things that they're going through. So I'm connected to the district, the personality of the district, and the issues of the 16th district. Um, I'm just a very genuine person. I genuinely want to help people. For me, it's not about politics. For me, it's not about um, career advancement and all of these different things. It's simply about being a voice and a, a, a voice and a champion for people. Right now, we don't have, in my opinion, we don't have champions for the people who are in tune to the heart, the spirit the soul and the needs of what people are, are looking for. And I want to be that person that, you know, that helps accomplish that. So my goal is to just simply uh, be very genuine, very humble, and, and very connected to the issues that people are really um, suffering from and need to benefit from. And I just want to say that, you know, I'm not bought and sold. I'm my own person. That's why I'm running as an independent. I'm not beholden to any party politics. I'm really listening to what the voice and what the needs of people are in our community. And if I'm fortunate enough to win this election, I think that will give me a significant leverage that I'm carrying the voice of the people and not the voice of a party. Dennis Walton of Milwaukee is an independent candidate in Assembly District 16. The election is November 3. Dennis, thank you for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Campaign 2020 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Quick Trip, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, and Wisconsin Operating Engineers Local 139.